Uh, my name's Luke. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my job to bring God's word to you today. Yeah. Excited to do so. I have to, hur- I have to hustle. You see what they do. <laughs> We've talked about this before. All he was supposed to do was get up here and tell you to go right. And he takes six, seven minutes of my time, and then I got, then he, he always comes down, you know, you, you know, and you feel guilty about something, and so you go down and you try to make like a little light of it, he comes down, he's like, you got plenty of time, you got plenty of time. <laughs> so we got to get right to it so that we can get you out of here, and uh, God is doing some incredible things here at New Life. I'm going to try my best not to move around a lot. I went to the youth basketball night last night, and it was awesome, it was awesome. There was a ton, a ton of teenagers there. Uh, just playing basketball and having a good time, and uh, I went, and I went a little too hard, and uh, so I can't, I can't, can't move as much as well as I, as well as I used to. Uh, but uh, God is doing some awesome things uh, here at New Life. We are in this series. Uh, I, I, I know you're not supposed to play favorites. You know your series. They're supposed to be like your kids. You're not supposed to pick a favorite. Um, but I, I really enjoy this type of series. I'm a basic guy. I'm a simple man. I don't, my wife always says that. She's like, you're, you, you, it doesn't really take much. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It really doesn't. I'm pretty easy going, pretty even keel. Put me on the couch, give me some ice cream, a good game on. I'm good to go. Last day of the NBA regular season today, a lot on the line for a lot of different teams. You will find me on my couch from when I get home this afternoon until I get up to go to bed later tonight. You say, that's so boring. No, it's amazing. (laughs) And I can't wait. I'm a simple guy. And so I love series like this because I believe that God's word is meant to be simple. Our salvation, our following Christ, it, it wasn't meant to be this over complicated thing where we're where we sit struggling trying to figure out how, how do I do this how do I do God's word is it's so clear and it's so basic at its foundation of this is what you need to do if you want to follow after me and so I, I, I'm, I'm excited to preach to you today if you weren't here last week we learned how to read the Bible I hope that it helped you. I hope that it encouraged you. I hope that this week you put some of those things into practice. You understand there's no point in getting knowledge if you're not going to put it into practice. I hope you didn't leave last Sunday and go, wow, that was good stuff, and then didn't do it all week long. That would be pretty silly. If someone told you to work on something, to fix something at your job or at school or on a team or wherever you are, hey, you know what? You really struggle with this. You should work on that. Oh, okay, great. That's great advice. And then you never work on it. It wouldn't make any sense. We got incredible teaching last week about how to read the Bible, and I hope that you applied it to your life. And if you weren't here last week, or you're watching online for the first time, or you're here in the building for the first time, and you missed it, go back and listen to last last week's message, because last week's and this week's kind of go hand in hand. Like my dad said last week, how to read the Bible and what we're going to talk about today are, are intertwined, where it's like, ah, which one should go first? It doesn't really matter. Let's do that one first. It's kind of 1A, 1B. They, they go together. Today, what I want to talk to you about is how to pray. I want to talk to you about how to pray. Like I said, the two of these things go hand in hand because if you take them at their simplest form, reading the Bible and praying are really God just telling us, hey, listen, I want you to learn as much about me as you can, and I want you to talk to me as much as you can. Like in any relationship, like in any relationship, your goal is to find out as much about the other person as you possibly can so that you can grow more in love with them and then talk to them and fellowship with them and have communion with them and understand who they are on a personal level. This is the relationship that God wants to have with us. I don't know why. I don't get it. Our brains will never be able to comprehend or wrap around the fact that the God who created the universe actually wants to help us and have relationship with us. He wants to talk to us. He wants us to read his word. He wants to help us through life and said, here, here's a guidebook. And you know what? I won't just give you the guidebook. Anytime you need to call me for instruction on it, 
I'm here. I won't leave you on red. I won't send you to voicemail. Do you hate it when people leave you on red? It aggravates me. First of all, it aggravates me because I don't know why everyone doesn't just turn that off. I don't know why you would want people to see when you've read their text messages. I don't understand it. But then, to then read it, it's like a double aggravation. You ever have somebody kind of aggravate you and you're frustrated by one thing, but then the other thing kind of compounds it? That, that, that it aggravates. I'm like, first of all, why do you have this on? Second of all, you know that you have this on, so you know that I saw that you read this and you still haven't texted me back. It's a double slap in the face. So if you're in here today, you need to turn that off, okay? Because it's aggravating all of us. We will never talk to God and keep looking at it and go, it says God read it, but he hasn't, hasn't responded. I, God is a God that at the mention of his name, the moment that we call out to him, he hears us. But sometimes, like was said last week, the reason this series was really birthed out of a lot of different conversations that we've had with a lot of, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Did you see this slide? Uh, I, I, this, conver- this series was, was, was birthed out of conversations that we've had with a lot of different people that are just new believers. There's it's not anything wrong with it. That's awesome. But they've asked us, where do I start reading the Bible? How do I talk to God? And for those of us who've grown up in church, we could easily look at that and go, are you kidding me? But I, I think it's awesome yes. to be able to say, hey, you know what? Let's do a whole series trying to teach people about these basic principles of how to do these things that God has called us to do so that we could further our relationship with him. And so today, I want to talk to you about a couple different things. First off, I'm, again, I'm the type of person, I'm a logical thinker. So before before we get into how to pray, we need to realize and think about why do we pray? Why should we pray? I'm a big believer in if Jesus did it, I want to do it. If you've never been baptized, you should get baptized. If you don't love other people, you should love other people. If you don't forgive easily, you should forgive easily. The list goes on and on of the things that Jesus did and showed us when he walked this earth that we read about that we should apply to our lives because if Jesus did it, we should do it. Prayer is one of those things. Prayer is one of those things that was paramount. You say, what? Jesus, the Son of God, who left heaven to come to this earth to die on a cross for you and for me, knew how important prayer was. I I don't have time because this isn't my message today, but but I wasn't going to talk about prayer with and leave Jesus out. I'm not trying to get struck down dead up here, okay? So I'm not going to talk about prayer and leave Jesus out. So I don't have time to read them all or preach them all. You can take a picture of it if if you can. Jesus understood the the importance of prayer and the power of prayer. He thanks God for his revelation. He prays before raising Lazarus. He prays for himself, then his disciples, then all of us. He prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays on the cross. He prays at his baptism. He he regularly withdraws from the crowds to pray. He prays healing people in the evening, before walking on water, before choosing the 12 disciples, before Peter's confession, at the transfiguration. Jesus says that he actually prays for Peter's faith. Verse after verse after verse, take a picture of it, go read them for yourself, where Jesus understood the power and the importance of prayer. And if you'll look at that list, what you'll notice is Jesus prays before huge events, after huge events, during huge events, away on his own, in his own quiet time. There, there was no specific time. Oh, Jesus always prayed. He prayed for everything. Yeah. The big things, the small things, the times where he needed filling up. Yeah. He understood the power and the importance of prayer. In Luke 11, after praying for himself, he then teaches his disciples. It's the only question that we really see the disciples asking. In Luke 11, it says, after praying himself, He teaches his disciples, it says, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, 
just as John also taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, pray like this, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, who has offended and wronged us, and lead us not into, into temptation, but rescue us from evil. The disciples who have watched Jesus, they could have said, teach us, please teach us how to heal the blind. Teach us how to turn water into wine. Teach us how to do this. Teach us how to do that. No, no, no. What do they want to know? Teach us how to do that. Because every time you do that over there, you do this first. And, And so it'd be cool to learn how to do that, but we're pretty dumb, but we're not that dumb. And so we understand that every time you do that cool thing over there, you go and do this first. And so that should be of utmost importance to us. So please, before you teach us how to do that, teach us how to do this. Teach us how to get on our knees and talk to our Father. Teach us how to communicate with the one who's given you the power and the strength to do this. And there's a whole lot of people in the church today that want to do all that cool stuff, but they don't want to do what comes before that. They don't want to take time out of their day to talk to God. God, send me into my school. Send me into my job. Help me to rescue the law. But but we won't take the time to fall on our knees and just talk to our Heavenly Father, the one who wants to give us the power and the strength to go do all that He has called us to do. So that's the why. I, I, again, I couldn't, I couldn't leave the why out because I want you to understand, man, how do, how do we pray? Great, but why, why do we pray? We pray because Jesus understood the power and the importance of it. His disciples understood the power and the importance of it. And so we should also understand that. That was my intro. That's what he always does. Do that, was my, that was my intro. My text, Colossians chapter 4, Paul says, Be persistent and devoted to prayer, being alert and focused in your prayer life with an attitude of thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us too, that God will open a door of opportunity to us for the word, to proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I have been imprisoned, that I may make it clear and speak boldly and unfold the mystery in the way that I should. Paul is showing us a couple of things through this passage of Scripture, and this is the portion of God's Word that I want to kind of dig into today and figure out how to pray and what to pray for. Because I think it's great when we learn how to pray, but sometimes we don't know what to pray for. And I believe that Paul shows us all of it in here because Paul's Paul. He's pretty cool. So quickly, I'll give them to you. They're Plain and simple. The first thing, you want to know how to pray. This is how you pray, according to Paul. Pray persistently. Pray persistently. The beginning of that verse says, be persistent and devoted to prayer. The Greek word that's translated for that word devoted is used often in connection with prayer. Devoted in Webster's 1828 dictionary says, appropriated by vow. Solemnly set apart or dedicated, consecrated, addicted. That when we devote ourselves to prayer, it's something that we can't live without. That when a morning goes by and we've maybe been a little bit rushed and we get to our office and we sit at our desk, that our body knows, man, I didn't talk to God yet today. Ah, God, I'm sorry, I messed up, I've been too bit... When a couple of days goes by and we haven't been in our secret place and we haven't communicated with him the way that we know we're supposed to, we're not the same. Do you remember what life was like before you prayed and how different it is now that you do? If it's become a spiritual discipline for you, if you do it every day, have you ever had maybe a couple days go by where you're just super busy or life's been really hard and you realize, now I know why I'm so off. Now I know why, why things are so messed. I'm, I haven't talked to God. It, it's this thing that we become addicted to. Listen, listen, in the early church, 
that word devoted. Listen, Acts chapter 1, it said, all these with one mind and one purpose were continually devoting themselves to prayer, waiting together along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Acts chapter 2, it says they were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to the instruction of the apostles, to fellowship, to eating meals together, and to prayers. Acts chapter 6, but we will continue to devote ourselves steadfastly to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Romans 12, constantly rejoicing in hope because of our confidence, steadfast and patient in distress, devoted to prayer continually seeking wisdom, guidance, and strength. You understand that this is what prayer unlocks. You say, oh, what's, my, what's my purpose? What's my journey? What's my... Figure out how to pray. And guess what comes? Wisdom, guidance, strength. Why? Because we're talking to a God that holds the universe in his hands. You say, oh, God, I, I need help making this decision. I need... Talk to him about it. Figure out how to pray with this devotion, with this persistent prayer. First Thessalonians, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is actually the will of God that you will be persistent in prayer. And every time we read that verse, people think, to, people think because it says pray without ceasing. They think, wait, we're supposed to just pray all the time. That's not what, what the verse is saying. What it's saying is, listen, persistent and, and devoted to prayer doesn't mean praying nonstop every minute of the day. It means coming back to prayer as a first resort over and over again. That when life is hard, that when life is challenging, when life is awesome, we are continually talking to God, our Heavenly Father. It also doesn't mean that your prayers need to be super long. <clears throat> if you can pray for 30, 40 minutes, great. I don't know how you do it. You say, Pastor, that's not very spiritual. You don't pray for an hour straight every morning. No. <laughs> There's no way. Nor do I think it's necessary. Because guess what I get to do? I get to talk to God whenever I want. Yeah. And so when I drop my kids off at school on the drive home, guess what I get to do? Talk to God about my kids at school. When, when I walk into their rooms at night and they're, and they're sleeping and I'm standing over their bed and super creepy, <laughs> guess what I get to do? I get to pray over them. When I'm at work in the middle of the day and I know that my son's got something in the afternoon, guess what I get to do? I get to talk to God about it. Hallelujah. Sure, there's, there's a secret place time. There's a time to get away. There's a time to do the things, the spiritual disciplines that turn you into a mature Christian, right? We don't want to stay on mommy's milk or baby food. We want to grow up and have a steak. Amen. And so we need to get in the secret place. We need to create spiritual disciplines and do the things that God has called us to do. But this whole idea of praying persistently is just understanding. It doesn't matter how long I pray or if I have to pray all day long. It just matters. It, all that matters is that I know whenever I need to talk to God, I can talk to God. In the afternoon, in the morning, in the night, in the middle, in the middle of the night, I can wake up freaked out because of a dream I had or something that's going on. And guess what? My daughter wakes me up. I had a bad dream. My, my daughter... My daughter's nine. I could probably count, well, maybe a little more than two hands, the time she's actually slept through the night, okay? And for some reason, for some reason, every child that I've ever known in the history of the world, including myself, calls for their mother. It's their mother. For some reason, my daughter, since she could speak, Daddy! <laughs> Daddy! I don't know why. I've asked the Lord to change her heart multiple times. I've thought about just changing the name. Hey, listen, babe, you're daddy from now on. I'm mommy. Like, this is, this is we're, changing, we're changing the names. Whoa, we're not that kind of church. Easy there. Relax. Relax. We'll take that out of context. 
every time. You realize that when you wake up in the middle of the night, now don't call dad, don't call God daddy, all right? Don't be calling that. I'll come to your house and slap you and start doing that. But <laughs> you wake up in the middle of the night, stressed out, something big's coming up. You just got bad news. You had a nightmare. Guess what you get to do? You get to talk to God. Hallelujah. It's this idea of figuring out, man, how do I, how do I talk to God consistently throughout the day? How do I walk into a meeting and go, God, strengthen me and be with me in this meeting today. Bless every word that comes out of my mouth. Give me opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Wait, you mean that's it? I could pray that quick? Yeah, you can pray that quick. God, help me today as I go in to take this test. I, I, I put in the work last night. I studied. God, help me to remember everything that I, that I went over in Jesus' name. Amen. God, as I walk the halls of my high school, God, as I walk into this office building today, give me opportunity to, to, to speak life and truth into somebody's situation. Help me to be a good example of you. Put, but help me to put joy on today, God. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm a little grumpy. Help me to put joy on today, God. God, watch over my kids at school. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. Help them to have a good day. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. I, I can just do that throughout the day? That's exactly what praying persistently is. Jesus told two parables. I, I, I'm a big believer. A lot of, some people will tell you, oh, Jesus made these stories up. I, he's Jesus. I don't think he made the parables up. He's seen everything and knows everything. And so I don't think he's just, oh, you know, yeah, I'm just going to make this story up about the prodigal son. No, I think that actually happened. And Jesus tells two parables. And I love Jesus' sense of humor. Jesus, is a, he's a funny guy. When you actually dig in, you read, and you, 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 you read it with the inflection of someone, he was sarcastic, he was witty, he was cutting. And he tells two parables about praying, and both of the parables are actually quite humorous. And he tells one about a, a guy that's asleep, and somebody is knocking on his door because they need something, and the guy's like, oh, forget it, I'm, if just, you, you ever done that when somebody, you know, when the people come to your house, and you're like, act like you're not here. <laughs> Everybody... Everybody be quiet. We're not here right now, and we don't want solar. Please leave. <laughs> and Jesus tells this parable. The guy's like, shh, everybody be quiet. Act like you're not here. And it says, they keep, keep knocking at the door. And Jesus tells this parable, and he says, when you pray, this is how you should pray. You should keep knocking at the door. You should pray persistently. God, heal my sick loved one. God, save my lost child. God, and you should pray persistently like someone. No, hey, I know you're in there. I know you're home. I know you're home. He tells another story about a, a woman that's before a judge, and the judge won't grant her what, what she wants, but she keeps asking and keeps asking so much so that the judge gets so annoyed and fed up with her. He says, just take, take go, just go. Take what you want and go. Jesus says, this is how you should pray with a persistence, with a fervor, with a devotion that says, man, I won't stop praying until what I need comes to pass or until what you want to do in my life happens. God, I won't stop thanking you for all the good things that you've done to me. I, I heard a relatively, I won't say famous because he's not, he's a relatively famous pastor talk a couple weeks ago. And he was trying to make the point that God is so good and so great and so big that once you pray for something that you need, stop praying about it. He's God. Like, God, heal, heal my, my sick loved one. All right, now quit praying about that. Don't ever pray about that again. God heard you. He's God. He knows it. That, could be, that, that, could, that is so far from what Scripture tries to tell us about what praying is. He, he needs to listen to last week's sermon because he needs to open the book every now and then. Jesus says, knock and keep knocking, and the door will, the door will answer, but you gotta, you gotta keep on knocking. You gotta keep trusting, and you gotta pray persistently. I need to preach persistently right now because I am quickly running out of time. <laughs> we also need to pray specifically. You need to pray specifically. Paul says being alert and focused in your prayer life. People often think, well, he's God. He knows everything. So what's the point? It, you understand that when you communicate something to somebody, even if they know already what you need, what you're showing is your faith in them to meet your need. Right. If I go to my dad, I won't do it now. It's, it's three services now. I could really get a lot of money out of them, but I won't do it now. <laughs> 
But if I go to my dad and say, dad, listen, I really need, he, if he already knows, oh, Luke, Luke needs money, new pair of sneakers, you know, Luke needs money. <laughs> but but what, does, what does me going and confessing to him that, hey, you know, I, it, it shows my, my need for him to do something in my life. You say, well, God already knows. Listen, again, the coolest part about Jesus, we see it time and time again. Jesus has this way of making people tell him what it is that they need or want, even though he already knows it, because he wants to see their faith. Jesus heals a, a blind man, blind Bartimaeus. It's one of my favorite stories because Jesus asks him, what is it that you want me to do? And I always read it, and I'm like, what? It's blind Bartimaeus. What's he going to be like? Well, you know, I rolled my ankle the other day because, you know, I couldn't see that pothole, you know? Could you heal my... Like, he's blind. Of course, he wants to see. But Jesus asked him why, because he wants him to verbally express to Jesus what it is that he needs so that when Jesus heals him, he understands it wasn't anything he did, but what Jesus did. He says, Lord, I want my sight. And Jesus said, boom, your sight's restored. This is who Jesus is. And when we pray, this is how we need to pray. Listen, he will never force you to tell him anything. But he longs to hear the things that you need and desire. I think many times we fear asking for something specifically because we're afraid it won't happen. But you're not fooling God. He knows the specifics already, but part of being in relationship is being honest and communicating what we want to him. When we remain in a relationship with him, we can ask for things in faith and ask specifically using what we know of his desires for our life. We know because his word tells us that he wants to meet our needs, that he wants to bless, that he wants to move. But there are times where we don't ask and then we wonder, man, why hasn't God moved in this situation? And God's like, are you going to tell me what it is that you need me to do? You got you to gotta pray specifically. Can I, these aren't slides or anything, and, and I, I have to rush. But I, I can't talk about prayer without leaving these. There's three things that I just want to help you with if I can for a minute. And I'll stand over here because that's what we're supposed to do. Because the, these aren't scriptural things. These are just... I'm Luke, I'm a pastor at, <clears throat> at New Life, and I've been in church for almost 40 years. And so these are just things that over the end, I have people who are above me. My, my grandfather is one of the most incredible prayers that I've ever heard in my entire life. I joked before about not being able to pray for an hour. He could pray for 24 hours if you want him to. He, choose, he doesn't because he understands the principle, but he could. He'd be quoting hymns and scriptures and all, he just, the guy can't remember what he did yesterday, but he could quote a hymn from 40 years ago like it's nothing, right? It's incredible. Have you ever been to our men's Tuesday morning prayer meeting? You should come. 9 a.m. every Tuesday morning, you have a men's. Wednesday, 9 a.m., there's a ladies one. Every Tuesday morning that my grandfather comes and prays, he starts it off with like the first three lines of a hymn that no one's ever heard of or ever remembered. And you'd be like, hey, what'd you go to get at the grocery store yesterday? He's like, grocery store? I didn't go to the grocery store. You're like, yes, you did. But he can remember that. It's incredible. It's incredible. But I've had people throughout the years, I hope that you're okay with correction. You understand to be the best, most mature Christian that you can be. You have to learn how to be corrected and taught something. And I take a lot of pride. I know we're not supposed to have pride. Oh, I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I am a teachable person. I can be corrected. I've had people come up to me. I'm coachable. That's a better way to put it. I've had people come up to me and tell me, hey, don't do this, do this. Okay, cool. Don't do this, do that. Don't do that like that. Do it like this. Okay, cool, 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 cool. That's how, that's how we grow. And so can I just help you? When, you? when you're praying specifically, can I just help you? Jesus doesn't need to know every detail. Okay? If you're going to put, when I say pray specifically, I, I mean, God, heal Aunt Gladys. Touch her in her body and strengthen her. That's praying specifically. Jesus does not need to know. God, Aunt Gladys went to the doctor three weeks ago, and she got a bad report. And, you know, she went home, and, you know, she stubbed her toe on the way in. And, and then, you know, and then the next day, God doesn't need to know all that. He already knows all of it. And it has nothing to do with what you're actually praying about. 
You're praying that Aunt Gladys would get healed. So pray that Aunt Gladys would get healed. And leave all that other stuff for another time. I know some of you already, you're like, I'm offended. It's okay. I'm trying to help you. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need every detail. He also, this is just a pet peeve when you grow up in church. That's why I'm over here. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever had a small child? My, my daughter still, she's nine years old. She will say, Daddy, Daddy. We're the only two people in the room. Daddy. Daddy, I'm like, Harper, I'm right here. Obviously, if you begin to speak, I know you're talking to me. If not, we need to call somebody, okay? And she's like, no, I want you to look, I want you to acknowledge that I'm talking. You've you've been around small kids. Daddy, 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 daddy. Can I encourage you, when you pray, God doesn't need to set you to say his name over and over and over and over again. Nobody talks like this. Nobody talks like this. But for some reason, Christians, especially when we, even Christians who've been saved a long time, I, I've actually found that new Christians don't do this as much as Christians that have been saved a long time. We feel like we need to over-spiritualize our prayer by saying God's name a hundred times in a prayer. Stop. He knows his name. God, bless this day, God. Father God, we thank you for all that you've done today, Lord. God, you're so good, God. We praise you today, God. You laugh, you laugh, but I am deadly serious. We don't talk like this, but for some reason we pray like this. I don't walk up to my dad and go, Dad, how's your day today, Mark? Father, can you please help me today? Dad, I don't, I don't, we don't talk like this. But for some reason when we pray, we feel like, can I encourage you? Just slow down. A lot of times we put God's name into places because we don't want to like have a pause in our prayer. What I've found is that if you just slow down, it's okay to pause every now and then. It's okay to say, God, I ask that you just bless this day. You know exactly what it is that I'm going through. You see what I did? Instead of saying Lord again or God again, you just, just pause, just slow down. It's going to be okay. I promise. It's good. And listen, if you're like, oh, I've been praying like that for 30 years. It's okay, God still loves you, but stop, okay? <laughs> figure, figure out, please figure out how to stop. And, and the third thing that I, that I would recommend is that we were already told about last week, write it down. Yeah, right. If every time you pray, you get this, this like verbal exhaustion of telling God every single thing that you did over the past week that he doesn't care about, he's like, get to the point. What do you want me to fix? If that's you, or if you say, Lord, God, Father, God, Father, over and over and over. Can I encourage you? Write your prayer down in your secret place. We learned about it last week. Pray scripture back to God. Write it down. God, I thank you for what you did today. I thank you that you're this. I thank you that you're this. I thank you that you've done this. Write it, write it down. Guess what? Guess what that'll help you? You say, but then I won't be able to close my eyes. <laughs> oh, no. Because the first thing Jesus said when the disciples told to teach him how to pray was he said, close your eyes and bow your head. No, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Just, spoiler alert, he didn't. All, closing your all that's doing is blocking out distraction. But guess what? You're going to think I'm unspiritual. I get more distracted with my eyes closed than my eyes open. I do. When I pray, I pray with my eyes open. When I close my eyes, guess what happens? I'm thinking about a whole bunch of stuff right now. It's insane. But when my eyes are open, guess what I can do? I can lock in. I'm different. Maybe you're different. You need to close. But it's not a rule. It's nowhere in God's word. You must close your eyes or God will strike you dead. Like, relax. (laughs) Write your prayer out. Write it out clearly. Write it out concisely. Write it out specifically. What is it that I need God to do? What is it that God's done for me? What is it that God is doing? And what is it that I need God to do? And then pray that to him. And watch and see how all of a sudden, you do that for long enough, you'll begin to become a better communicator with God. You say, you mean there's better prayers? than Yes, there are better prayers than others. It's a skill. And it's like all skills, the more you do it, the better you will become. But if you've been doing it wrong the whole time, the worse you're going to become. So take some correction, figure out how to fix it, how to do it better, and then go and do it. 
Charles, I think it was Charles Spurgeon. I don't have it written down here. It says, to pray is to enter the treasure house of God and to gather riches out of an inexhaustible storehouse. It's like walking in somewhere and saying, I want all this good stuff. That's what, that's what prayer is. That's what prayer does. And the third thing is you need to pray thankfully. You need to pray with an attitude, Paul says, with an attitude of thanksgiving. To pray thankfully is to pray in faith about where our circumstances were, where they are, and where they're going to be. You hear me pray a lot of times when I'm up here. Uh, I'm sure you, you kind of get it by now. But a lot of times I'll pray, God, I thank you for all you've done, for all that you're doing, and for all that you're going to do. Because you understand that God has it all in his hands. And that if I'm on a mountaintop, it's good to pray, God, thank you that I'm here. But don't forget to thank him for what he taught you in the valley. And don't forget to thank him for what he's going to do because no matter what, God is good. And God wants to see us through. And so we need to pray for this with this attitude of thankfulness that says, God, I, I'm just grateful for all that you've done in my life. God, I'm thankful for the way that you've blessed me. There was a, a I, I didn't, I, I hated school, and I still hate school. I hate it more now having to help my kids than I did when I was in school. <laughs> we went away the week before spring break, and so my kids had all their makeup work, and they were supposed to do it this past week, and they have, they've been doing it, but yesterday was like a tornado of, oh, I, oh, I forgot to do, oh, I, I, what about that, oh, I don't want to do that, oh, I don't, you know, they always, you know, kids, they always put the worst thing for last, right? So my daughter had her math, and my son had his reading left. You know, which is like the two words. And my son's like, Dad, I need you to come help me with this. I can't figure this out. And I'm like, you're in fifth grade. Leave me alone. <laughs> He's like, what's the Emancipation Proclamation? I'm like, ask Alexa. <laughs> this is why she was created to help parents, right? Leave me alone. I'm like, it's Saturday. I didn't do my homework when I was in school. I'm certainly not doing yours. <laughs> But there are little things, you know, I, I, I'm not a big, I, I believe in school, you should say in school. Um, but there are a lot of things in school that I think are, you know, they're useless and silly. And, uh, and they just, they're just time wasters to, to make people feel better about, oh, my kids were in school. It's like, psh, whatever. Um, kids, don't, kids graduate high school and college, they don't know how to do their taxes, but they, they know the square root of this, this, and this that they're never going to need. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, oh my gosh, I got to hurry. Um, when I was in 10th grade, I had the privilege of going to a Christian school. If you can go to a Christian school, I recommend that you do because of moments like this, because I never would have had this moment if I, I didn't go to a Christian school. Uh, in 10th grade, we read in Bible class, and 10th grade, I have to admit to you, that was my worst year. I was not living for the Lord at that time. And uh, we had to read this book called The Prayer of Jabez, Jabez, however you want to say it, by Max Lucado. It's a really famous book. It's, you know, it's one of the greatest selling books of all time now or whatever. Uh, and we had to read this book. I, I confess to you, I'm not even saying this to be, you know, I read one chapter of that book, one chapter. I did not do very well in that class. Uh, I read one chapter of that book. That one chapter that I read has stuck with me. And you would think, man, that chapter really was meaningful. You would have read the rest of the book. No, I don't care. That one, <laughs> that one chapter, that one chapter, that one chapter changed. Uh, there's a, a, I don't even know what chapter it was, but there's a story about this man who gets to heaven and the, this angel's giving him a tour of heaven. And they keep walking by this door that's closed. And he's like, what's behind that door? And he's like, you can't go behind that door. You can't go by that. What's behind that door? You can't go behind that door. You can't go behind that. So he gives him this whole tour of, the, of heaven, right? He's like, oh, this is where this is. This is where this is. Come on, I just want to know. I just want to know what's behind that door. And the angel's like, you can't know what's behind that Come on, I just want to. Fine. Opens it up. And it's just a row of, of boxes. And they're in alphabetical order. And he figures this out and he runs and he finds his name and he pulls it down and he opens it up and he begins to look through it. And the angel says, all of a sudden the guy begins to get discouraged. The angel said, this is why I wasn't allowed to bring you in here, why I didn't want you to see this. It was a box full of everything that he could have had if he had just asked. It was a box full of everything that God wanted to bless him with if he had just asked for it. And as a 10th grader, it was like, who cares? 
But over the years, it has stuck with me, uh, this idea that, man, I don't want to get to heaven and God say, man, you didn't pray persistently. You didn't pray with an attitude that, 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 that was specific in what it was that you wanted. And you didn't pray, thankfully, for all, every time you pray, it's negative and it's sad and it's this and it's that and it's, it's oh, woe is me. You didn't pray with a thankful heart that says, God, thank you for what you brought me out of. And even though I'm going through something hard, God, you've saved me. And you've rescued me, and I'm on my way to heaven because of it. I'm supposed to tell you now <laughs> what to pray for, and I'm going to give them to you super fast, like in two minutes, so write them down. What to pray for. The first thing, pray for the workers. Pray for the workers. Pray for your pastors. Amen. All of us. Please, all of us. Yeah. I had a lady the other day. How's your family? Oh, we're good. Everybody's good. How's Jason? I pray for him every day. He's my favorite. I was like, man, that is messed up. I'm right here. It's messed up. Pray for all of us, please. Pray for the workers, Colossians 1. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that as you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Pray for us. Pray for yourself. Pray for volunteers. Pray for your church. That we might go out and spread the gospel. John Piper said, I love this quote. He said, our major problem with, with prayer is that we have made it a domestic intercom to call for refreshments from the butler rather than a wartime walkie-talkie to call in support for the troops. Ooh, I love that quote. Should have changed the words and said that I said it. You need to understand that you can pray for the power of God to be on other people. And that God would use them. The second thing you need to pray for that Paul tells us is you need to pray for open doors of the gospel. Paul says that God will open a door of opportunity to us to proclaim the mystery of Christ for which we have been in prison. Paul is in prison. He's in prison asking the church to pray that more do doors might be open. Talk about faith. He's like, I'm getting out of here. Of course I'm getting out of here. I'm not John the Baptist. Of course I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. And so when I do, please pray that more doors would be open so that I can get thrown back in prison. That's literally what he's basically saying. Oh, that we would pray with this, like, God, open doors for the gospel. Three services. God, fill them, fill them, fill them. We'll sit in the parking lot. We'll go right. Fill them, fill them. And the third thing that he says is that we should pray for clarity in presenting the gospel. He finishes the, the verse with that I may make it clear and speak boldly and unfold the mystery in the way that I should. I love that unfold the mystery, that there's this mystery of Christ that people are so confused about. And Paul said, watch me, watch me unfold this in a way that helps you understand. We need to pray. God, help me to communicate who you are to people clearly and effectively. You understand, again, Paul's praying in prison that doors of opportunity would open for him to preach the gospel, which got him in prison. And then you have Paul who wrote 13 letters and half the New Testament is praying, God, help me to be clear in the way that I... Paul is praying, God, help me to be clear in the way that I deliver this message. One of the greatest early church founding fathers, Paul, God, help me to be clear, help me to be clear. And yet we go, out, we go through the day thinking, oh, I got this. I can do this. I, I can. You need God's help. Yeah. If Paul had to pray, ask for prayer for it, then you need prayer for it. Yeah. Ask and pray that God would bless the workers, that he'd open the door of the gospel, and that there would be clarity in presenting it. Read your Bible. Figure out how to talk to God. Don't stop talking to God. Be specific in what it is that you want. And watch as you're thankful for all that he's blessed you with. God will continue to bless you because he'll continue to want your thanks. And he'll continue to want to move in your life. But you got to figure out how to talk to him and how to be in a relationship with him. Amen? Amen? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house. We pray that you would bless your people as they leave here today. Help them to go out into the world 
Strengthen your workers, God. Help them to be clear in the message that they deliver and open doors of opportunity for each and every one of them in their schools, at their jobs, in their families, in their communities, God. Bless them and move by your power and by your strength. As they depart, keep them safe. Help them to have a great week. Bring us back here Wednesday night. And God, please help us go right. In Jesus' name, amen.